Bethesda that much anymore. <laughs> yeah, Bethesda has its problems, but right now we're on Homeworld. An old game, but an interesting RTS. And I just realized I was watching Jorgie's stream, yeah. so now technically it looks like I'm double watching my stream. Anyway. Let's get on with it. Homeworld. Remaster Collection. Okay, so there's This is the garden of Kadesh. Okay. For 13 generations, we have protected it from the... Unclean. unclean. The tyrannic raiders who came before you refused oh. to join and were punished for this trespass. That Work is... Theirs, your ship has already defiled this oh, holy place. If you have come to join, we welcome you. And we'll spare you your ship until all have disembarked. If you have come to consume the garden, you will be removed at uh, once. Alright. What are your intentions? Well, hopefully soon I'll have a tell emote. That's we nice. We are the significance of this location. We need no conflict. Please allow us time to repair our engine so that we may withdraw as requested. If you will not join, then die. There is no withdrawal from the garden. Oh, wow. That's... The dude's voice is so creepy. Like, completely. And the way it moved around the ship. It just gave an arrow of... Ugh. But yeah, your story killer sounds very interesting. So far for a background. But yeah, that was... Did you ever get that little creep factor in the back of your neck when listening to him talk? Uh... A little bit. Hmm. But yeah, this is... From what I know, it's an interesting game. Remember, there are many space games out there, but only one has the Gardens of Kadesh. Cool. So is this homeworld thing like Even with in the, genre, the uh, as popular War, Warhammer universe? No, but funny enough, it's an interesting space RTS that moves in three dimensions instead of two. From uh, what I've heard. Oh, okay. You know, like actual space combat so once was, there are still plenty of space yeah. RTS games. However, most of these control on a flat plane, just like any other RTS. So instead of all of that, what if you wanted the full 3D space experience? Yeah. Outer space is a magical realm where you can travel in any direction and be killed by materials you've never heard of before. True. Controlling units on a flat plane doesn't quite give that experience. If you do want that, you have Homeworld. And Homeworld 2. Mm. And Homeworld Cataclysm. Then next is the Jupiter incident, but those last <laughs> two are stories for another day. There are some other little ones out there, but the point is, there's not a whole lot. And if you wanted yeah. this kind of game, Homeworld is where most people point you. It's an ambitious, groundbreaking game from 1999. That's insane. This also explains why I never heard of it. Some stuff from then you could pick up and play just fine. Homeworld has a barrier to it. Ah. It's still a great game, but interface issues are especially clunky to play nowadays. So in 2015, Gearbox, with the help of some original Relic developers, released the remastered collection. That's actually really nice to actually bring this old game back, considering how pivotal yeah. it's considered. I, When it comes to old games like this, this is obviously before my time, but still nice to see things getting remastered and released, even if, you know... Yeah. Some especially. You're cutting out. Oh, sorry. I said yeah, especially. Okay. It has reworked versions of 1 and 2, and the original versions are still included. This looks like a great deal, but there were and still are some issues. Okay. So let's get into that. Compared to the original, the freshly launched remaster looked amazing. It looked more Ooh. like a remake than a remaster, which wasn't too far from the truth. The main problem was that some systems were broken, particularly in Homeworld 1. The remaster ah. for both was based off of the Homeworld 2 engine, which does make sense considering the level the first game was at, but how both engines handle or even can comprehend different situations is incredibly different. For That's... example, in Homeworld, every ship is built and controlled okay. individually. You can still group them up and put them into formations, including custom formations. How you use these can give you a huge edge in battle. You could use a frigate cool. line to spread out firepower and screen for larger ships, move craft into a defensive sphere or a risky attack one, then combine that with tactics, which goes with your standard RTS stance system, trade oh. speed for more damage, or vice versa. So with both of those, you have a lot to play around with. 
Ships will try to hold their formation in combat, and their speed, shape, and aggressiveness will contribute to your success. If you wanted true 3D space combat, this is the kind of shit you live for. This also means problems mm -hmm. creep in when you use Homeworld 2's engine. In that, fighters, corvettes, and other small craft are automatically built as squads. The only things mm -hmm. built individually now are larger and special use ships. Formations oh, are super simplified and now tied to their stance. Setting interceptors to aggressive automatically makes them a claw and stuff like that. This was done to make micromanaging easier, which is a later conversation. But for okay. now, we have an engine that does not comprehend individual ships and formations existing together as a thing. Oh! Running a game all about using individual ships and putting them in formations. To put it simply, it didn't work. Formations yeah. broke apart the instant contact was made with the enemy. It would be a year and a half until the old system was brought back, but it would be across both games. Which oh, was fantastic good. news. Except it wasn't all quite there. This month would also be the last time the game got a patch, with a preview build for one that never came out being the last at the time of this video. <clears throat> Formations were implemented, but still had some significant bugs. The most notorious one being a formation of fighters would only have one ship firing. Meanwhile, the other ships are trying to pick their own targets and end up not firing at all. Maybe How does later. this happen? Well, let's go back in time. When I made the video on AVP Extinction, I asked for anyone involved with it to tell me more about it. One of them was a developer who did graphics work and programming on it. He okay. had some fun tidbits on how small the team was and how messy development got. When I, I mean, whenever I hear about a team that that's small and de uh, messy development and still releasing a pretty good game, it just shows me how great they could be if they were actually just given the time. True. When I say that some games sound like they had people grabbed out of the office to do voice acting, I'm not joking about that. Yeah, it happened they do here. that. They had grabbed the guy who did the unit artwork. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> he also had horrifying knowledge in that the game does have a PC version, but it wasn't part of the contract and never shipped. Anyways, oh. this was his first ever work on an RTS game, and he's stuck in the industry. He did a significant amount of work in the Homeworld remaster nice. and was able to answer a lot of questions. So here's some stuff I learned. It was never going to be viable to do a one-to-one -one remaster of both games. Okay. Think of it more like you could play Homeworld 1's campaign with 2's rules. What happened was that a lot of people went above and beyond. Again, they were doing a remaster oh. and not a remake. The original plan was to touch up the visuals, but an engine that old had its own issues and things weren't looking quite as nice as they could. Yeah, be. that usually so happens. So use a new solution, which was Henry yeah. building the graphics engine from scratch. The problem usually is, is it's quite literally like building a building of its own kind, where only the people that had the original blueprints and knew how it was made knows how it works, especially during that time of gaming. It uh, can be a whole mess. Like, that's how uh, originally Ratchet & Clank 1 was made. It's basically the only people that know how to run it, or it's basically made upon sticks. So the only people yeah. that know how to really mess with it are... Um, the original devs, and you can't really mod it. You can only mod like do he a single thing. He thought of some additions for the yeah. time, like what if beam weapons cast light? Then oh. they did. This is just an example from one person. A lot of wow. quality of life features and UI updates just weren't on the map at all. People were having to wear a lot of hats. A lot of the art staff, especially, was having to step up in unusual ways. After all, hmm. the original plan was let's port Homeworld One into the new system. It's a visual update. Why have any design staff? Things become yeah. even more complicated here. When it comes to combat, the games simulate a lot and don't cheat. To quote him, bullets leave a gun, fly, and hit shit. They do damage. That's it. He compares okay. it to the difference between an arcade driving game and a driving simulation. If it's wow. arcade rules, you can tweak numbers around to whatever. When things yeah. aren't all linked together so tightly, you have some wiggle room. When they are, things are much more difficult. Homeworld balance is affected by how a ship behaves, and the physical shape of a spaceship. And this Ooh. was being done by developers not specialized in it with the help of player volunteers. Getting formations working at a baseline took months of effort. How the engine handled formations and just the concept of flight had to be rebuilt. Huge parts of the game had to be retooled and all for what was supposed to be a simpler Homeworld HD. Why the patches suddenly stopped I have mm. no clue and can only speculate on. Yeah, they probably just stopped because Could they be wouldn't want reasons. them working anymore. Could be moving people to Homeworld 3. I have no clue, yeah. but it certainly wasn't a lack of passion from those working on it. I'm, the news is that I'm amazed the amount of passion you can find in the gaming industry, even still to today. Which, uh, yeah. Get rid of the critical remaining bugs. Enter the player's patch. This was developed by a lot of those volunteers I mentioned earlier. Oh, This nice. squashes a ton of bugs, rebalances some things to be smoother, everybody. and adds a whole bunch of new game options. It's on yeah. Steam Workshop, it's on ModDB if you use GOG. It's well worth getting, and I'll later explain some other options it adds in. So now that you're a little more caught up with the remaster situation, let's talk about Homeworld. On the distant planet of Carrick, clans waged endless war on each other. Carrick is a horrible desert wasteland. It's sort of similar to Dunes Arrakis, but there are no sandworms here. There's also That's no good. spice or anything of value, so Baron Harkonnen doesn't want it either. <laughs> what are you doing here instead of being in the desert? 
heading them off. It explored <laughs> these desert wars more in a prequel game, but again, that's a story for another day. What's important okay. is that the conflicts come to a close when a fantastic discovery is made. The wreckage of an ancient, massive starship is found. Even more startling is what they find aboard the ship. Deep inside the ruin was a single stone that would change the course of our history forever. On the stone was etched a galactic map and a single word more ancient than the clans themselves. Huh. Higara. Our home. Their true home. The story continues a century later. The discovery of the ship and the Guide Stone has united all the clans, and all the Kushan people have been busy. They've been preparing for unknown threats from space, and through reverse engineering they've developed formidable power. Their greatest project involves a massive colony ship they've been developing for 60 years. A neuroscientist oh. named Karen Sajet has entombed herself inside of the mothership to act as its organic computer and fleet command. The campaign okay. begins with the mothership's first proper test run. It's an enormous spaceship, and the testing doubles as the tutorial. Harvesters can collect asteroids, or gas, which can be taken aboard for processing. From there, it can construct smaller spacecraft. So the thing is capable of- So basically, it's normal RTS things. ...pumping out a fleet wherever it goes. It has facilities for studying salvage and researching new technologies. Okay. With other space traveling life out there, the Kushan will need to be able to adapt. However, the most important test being conducted is for the hyperdrive. A non-FTL ship oh. has been slow boating to the edge of the solar system for the past decade. Oh. It's just an easy matter of jumping over to them without exploding. This is some old mm. technology they're tapping into. I like that Karen sounds genuinely surprised that they didn't all blow up, or become part of a space hulk. Oh. We made it. Hyperspace jump complete. <laughs> surprised, I'm surprised we didn't explode immediately. Concept is good for homeworld. Hmm. All systems nominal, and the quantum wave effect has dissipated. We have I have heard that. The support ship is not here. Fleet Command will signal the car slim while we confirm our current position. So it is a missed jump, but not too far. Probing the oh. area reveals that the support vessel is nearby and ready to assist in the... Oh. Oh, okay, it's trashed and up on blocks. And the aliens who did it are still around. Mm. These vessels look... Very scrap heavy. Oh my god, they're even knocking to each other for funsies. They clearly don't like each other. Ah, it's a bunch of pirates. The hostile aliens gear up to attack and they're terrible at it. Their codename Kids Next Door spaceships are vastly <laughs> inferior. Even <laughs> salvage ships can easily yoink their corvettes away. So they have some enhanced interrogation to look forward to. I mean, they basically blew up a food truck. They had no chance in an actual fight. So aliens yeah. are around. The mothership will need to go back to be retrofitted. Basically blew up a food truck. Oh. The thing is... Oh. Oh. No one's left. Everything's gone. Karak is burning. Karak is being oh. consumed by a firestorm. The scaffold has been destroyed. Oh my god. All orbital facilities destroyed. Significant debris ring and low Karak orbit. A different alien fleet has arrived and lit the atmosphere on fire. They, they quite literally gassed the planet. Is what I can tell oh, here. Wow. Yeah, if you can yeah. see it like quite literally burning. Except for the mothership fleet yeah. and 600,000 cryogenically frozen colonists, the Kushan race has been wiped out. Finding wow. the homeworld is now about the survival of your civilization. And yeah, having your starting area be doomed isn't new to games. What they don't no. have is a Dodgio for strings. 400,000 people secured. Docking signal green. Yeah, that's a really Here good it's song all about too. Execution. Homeworld is a journey. You have no clue what could be out there besides a vague promise from a rock. I'll talk about the story more later, since for now I want to focus on the visuals. Again, the remaster had a ton of effort in this department. All the art for the cinematic cutscenes were completely redone. There were some rough looking parts in those, and they did a good mm. job bringing everything up to line. I can't deny that That's the fidelity nice. is way better in a lot of these scenes. The style has moved away from something that looks like a hand-drawn comic with the rough pencil lines, into something more clean and digital. I think the idea was to make the look more painting than pencil. That Overall, works. I like it a lot, and it adds a greater sense of scale in some scenes that didn't quite have it before. At the same time, mm. the quest for fidelity does change the mood of a few parts. 
Like when you first see Kim Sujet in the original, she's shrouded in darkness, facing off to the side. She looks strange and alien. They try to keep this aspect in the remaster, but now the scene's a lot more bight, she's directly facing the camera. The spirit is there, but the atmosphere is definitely different. Mm. And that sentence sounds like Zach Baggins reviewing a trip to space. <laughs> it's a solid improvement overall and hard to pull off artistically. It's one thing to tell an artist to draw something. It's another to say, redraw this, but make it better, but it also has to be like this. What do you yeah. mean revisions are extra? <laughs> Revisions are extra. <laughs> are giving birth. It's a rough. <laughs> god damn it, Mandalore. Oh my god. That's a, that's a joke we didn't need. Um, uh, yeah, I understand this as uh, someone that has worked with ours before for commissions. Just getting the idea that you have to you know, the artist to have them put from pen to paper is incredibly hard. Oh, yeah. Just getting the idea out of your head so that they can see what you're looking at is incredibly hard, so... Yeah. It, uh, asking someone to remake something that's similar to this but make it still get the same feeling as this is still hard. Rough life for artists out there. Yes, it is. When it, it comes is. to the game itself, it looks great, but especially for an RTS. You can have a ton of ships fighting on the screen. I love RTSs, even though I'm great. terrible at them. In the original game, you couldn't free sweep the camera like this. You had to follow objects. Probably because a computer from back then might self-immolate trying to capture all this. You can still zoom in on whatever you want and get up into the face of even the smallest craft. Cool. You see how they cast light and shadows or when larger objects darken them? Weapons can have multiple levels of effects, and even the results of them can linger. You know, besides when the ships are actively on fire and dying, oh. even when repairs are completed, some scars from battle never heal. Cool. Unless you turn the option off, which there are a lot of. There are like nine different texture options. If my computer you can could pick handle the that. Ship class to get battle scars. Again, excellent scalability if your PC isn't up to it. But yeah, man, there are some fine touches for a space strategy game. Back in the day, they sadly didn't have enough time to give each race its own special ship doctrine. In the campaign, mm. you could actually choose the enemy's ship Everything designs the instead, age of myth because you'd be getting the same mythology. units with the exception of two. You can't do that. Uh, you mean that RTS? I haven't gotten a chance to play it. Is the main thing because it's a newer RTS and my computer more than likely wouldn't be able to handle it. It's anymore. why I mostly focus on indie games and smaller games. It's likely for the best. Yeah. But the Kushan ships I can are play sleek, them on my angular console. and boxy. Most of their designs ah. are super utilitarian. If something doesn't help the ship do its job, get rid of it. Even as research Makes continues sense. and larger and more powerful ships unlock, that doesn't go away. They're smooth, but not the height of efficiency. The exception is, appropriately, the mothership. It's very curvy and feminine. It looks like an ancient fertility statue or a silhouette of a pregnant woman. Mm. Please don't draw it giving birth, it already does. <laughs> you're Contrast the one that made them with a mysterious type. Mandalor, you're the one that made the joke. You can't accuse anyone else of that because you're the one who started it. <laughs> you're the one before the remaster. Ah, no, I have not played that one. It and Empire. These guys have been spacefaring for thousands of years. Mm. Their ships are more ornate and bizarre and sometimes almost insect looking. What's extra yeah, cool is, despite kinda. the design differences, the ships still share similar silhouettes. The details are different, but you still hmm. know the ship's role just based on its general size and shape. You might think that readability could be a huge problem in this kind of game, but it rarely is. Get far enough That's away really to display shape icons. You may not have a mini-map, but you do have sensors mode. You can pop into this any time and view the entire theater. Cool. Even as complexity increases, you're never too far out of control. Group 7 reports enemy contact. Ooh. The upgraded space backgrounds also look fantastic. The early mm. missions in the campaign start in the more dark areas of space, right. but as it goes on you start passing through these colorful nebulas. What's funny is that the amount of effort just put into the backgrounds of this space RTS are insane, because usually if with space RTSs you can get away with much less in just having the background be black, because you're in space. You don't necessarily- they didn't necessarily need to do this, but the fact that they did makes it all the better. The closer you get to where home might be, the more orange space becomes. Maybe it's supposed to remind you of the deserts of Carrick, or maybe it's a coincidence. Whatever the case, the visuals in Homeworld come together wonderfully. Then you add in the remastered soundscape, and you have one hell of an atmosphere in an RTS game. Hmm. I got one. We're under fire. Under that trailer, I see him. You're looking fine. Acknowledged. Engaging targets of opportunity. Move order confirmed. Okay, the voice acting is amazingly well in this game. Even down to the yeah. units. Looking good. Stay tight. We've got enemy contact. Light fire confirmed. 
God damn. Ooh, I might have nine found something enemy from the thumbnails Group from nine the investigation copies. Locked on target. Nice. Group 7 reporting. Attack run initiated. Copy. I do like the sound effect even when you go like really far away where it's like you're on a sensor. Situation. I know there are people who like to smugly point out there's no sound in space, usually only prompted by a movie or game having great sound work. We don't have to put up with it. Let's just kill them. Speaking <laughs> of kill I, I do know that apparently he did get that kind of response for a video when he talks about great sound design. Yeah, I know everyone makes that saying that, uh, you know, there's no sound in space. It's just the sound of things bonking off of the hole. I don't care. Okay? We can have fun. We can make sounds in space. Yeah. Who cares if there's not actually sounds in space? We're having fun. Let us have our fun. <laughs> yes, let us have fun. We don't need to be um actually about space. Burn the heretic. Much. Killing, that's really the perfect way to describe Homeworld's sound design. <laughs> the beam cracks, the engines whining, the artillery echoes, it's all amazing. You can also yeah. have way more effects at once over the original. At the really? same time, some aspects have a less is more approach. The actual story of the first Homeworld, the plot and the details, is very simple. When characters do show up, they're not there to add some personal drama. I'm not saying that would be bad to do because Ace Combat is sick. It's more that you're mm. playing Karen, yeah, which, by I played Ace Combat ship, Seven. which by extension is an entire civilization. The character oh. you're playing is that massive metal beehive, which means the stakes are too high for personal drama. When the intro goes, She is now Fleet Command. Yeah, goodbye human character. You are playing a hive mind abstract. <laughs> Still use that freaking sound whenever there's electricity. Karen Sujet doesn't give a shit if James Callis is having another mental breakdown aboard a carrier, and neither should you. Yet, a lot of people still yeah. consider Homeworld to be a very emotional game. This is a story immeasurably elevated by its voice acting and its direction. The fleet intelligence is an organization, but you only hear the voice of a single person. Mm. He's just some stoic guy. His job is to give reports. We advise commencing research immediately. So how do they use him when everything he knows is gone? The scaffold has been destroyed. It sounds like he's out of breath. All orbital facilities destroyed. He never remarked yeah. on how clearly horrible it is. You just hear the devastation in his voice and his speaking pace. Yeah, pretty much. Swells. Homeworld doesn't want to spell out emotion, well. it wants to evoke it. No Basically, it's a saying of either show, don't tell. Show me that they are sad. Don't tell me they are sad. It's a very simple process that some people don't realize, but yeah. It, this is sad. I took care of you, saved you from your miserable life. What the hell Even game the abstract is this? sensors menu where you don't directly see the combat, you still hear the comm chatter. They announce what they're doing, but sometimes you hear them celebrate victories. They get nervous or scared. The human element isn't gone. Even as Fleet Command coldly announces a ship loss due to the way the game is structured, it resonates a little more than just using an RTS unit. The mm -hmm. other characters you encounter are ships, which usually represent an entire people. So the voice acting has to carry a lot more. The line uh. says what event happened a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, but the tone says how the race felt about it. Your mortal mm. enemy is the tight end, but you never talk to them, you just learn about them. The one message you get from them is brief and very direct. So with how Homeworld has introduced everybody else, this keeps them vague and threatening right up until the end. It's impressive. They made a memorable, captivating sci-fi story for a game, and they did it without getting too lore or jargon heavy. There are great games that do explore those ideas, but with some rewrites, you could probably move Homeworld's story into another setting. Strip it all away and the spaceship game has a very human story. For the remaster, they brought the original voice actors back to re-record their lines with better technology and fidelity. They didn't change the writing at all, the lines are exactly the same. Fans argue about which line delivery is better. What? The new line overall is alright, for example, if you have to come to the garden, you will remove it once. That tone, sneering tone, I affect you. Original was so badass, the remake is... Oh, wait, they fight over line delivery. <laughs> what is this? Where's my wife? <laughs> a Homeworld 1 dork lore argument is about emotional tone. It's like the opposite of a Starsworth thread. At least yeah. until someone brings up Homeworld 2. And the music's cool. Show no mercy. Yeah, the music sounds pretty good. When my piece could run it, I'd probably give the game a try. I doubt it could. I've got to get to the gameplay or else I could talk about this kind of stuff forever. I always wondered if the composer for the 2003 Battlestar Galactica was a fan of the game. I mean, hell, mm. the game is inspired by the 70s show. Clearly there were people working on it who were down with the video games. 
They oh. must not learn of our contact. We must depart. All that moves is easily heard in the void. We will listen for you. Farewell. All this has happened before. And will happen again. As for the actual game, yeah, they probably do. Learn, but hard to master. You move units just like you would in most RTS games, but you can also hold a button down to change the mm. elevation. This gives oh. you a lot of maneuvering options, and the game throws in some unique challenges with it. In one mission, you have asteroids approaching the mothership from multiple layers, which you need to hold off with the proper alignment of ships. Or another, okay. where you need to carefully maneuver your ships through dust clouds. Otherwise, they start cooking in the system's intense radiation. Besides examples Oof. like that, 3D space directly impacts combat based on where damage is dealt. Ships in this setting rely on armor, and sometimes it's weaker from a certain direction. That because makes sense. you could take on a capital ship like a carrier in a head-on slap fight. But their armor is weaker at the top, so maneuvering your fleet above them will crunch emotes. through them much faster. Again, you can factor in the formations and tactics from earlier into this, but none of it is hard to pull off. Ships might have a single unique ability. You can click drag mm. for guard orders or repair operations or an attack, and it's all kept simple. The biggest barrier to entry really is just the way of thinking, since there are still precious few strategy games like this. Yeah, Anyways I wish there were more. Far below your forces or other strange angles is something you have to get used to. Homeworld has enough quality of life features to stop that from being overwhelming. Once you do get used to the basics, you can appreciate how the game is balanced out. Using big doom ships like cruisers are fun, but they're not a death stack solution. They could be vulnerable mm. to smaller craft like bombers, so ah. there are fighters and interceptors to counteract them. You could counter these with other strike craft or move up to using corvettes. They're still a little too nimble to be reliably hit by the larger weapons. But these are vulnerable to other corvettes, or frigates, but frigates are vulnerable to the big capital ship guns again. But there oh. are anti-capital frigates. Hell, there are anti-strike craft frigates. Oh. You can create all kinds of fleet compositions God that damn. can work. But figuring out how they work, and especially how they synchronize with other units, is the key. Because if you just look at one, a carrier is a big scary ship. It has a few different weapons on it, it can build other ships instead of just holding them, and it can also be yoinked away by some of the smallest craft in the game. What? There are limits on how much of a thing you can build, and there's no one unit solution. It's a blast putting a fleet together and then breaking it up into battle groups, attacking an enemy from multiple angles, and the interface is good enough that you don't have to master a ton of hotkeys or be a micromanaging god to have a good time with it. It's in that That's Age nice. of Empires ideal zone of fun. You could pick the game up and take things slowly and be just fine. But if you want to light up your keyboard and get sweaty, multiplayer will show you how high that Aww. ceiling can get. It might not be quite on AoE 2's level though. Back when it was still stuck on Game Ranger, I played with a guy who could reliably predict when he'd hit Castle Age within about 10 seconds based on where the deer were on the map. What? I haven't felt that kind of fear playing this. Now compared to the original, there are some key gameplay differences. How building works isn't quite strategy. the same. Wait, can you use the enemy ships you steal? Or do you like use them to gain technology? Because that is a big difference to me. That is a very big difference. I like the idea of stealing ships and actually being able to use them. Okay, who's the... Okay, no one's talking. Alright. Yes, you can do both? Some balance changes. Oh, that's great. And some quality of life features like being able to group salvage just aren't here. I do want to go over the two that I think are the most important. The you biggest can use universal them? change ah, is that's fuel. Good. In the original, smaller like craft like fighters and bombers occasionally have to come back to support ships to resupply. So there is an extra element in fighting strike craft in that you could blow up their support ships. In the remaster, no tech? there All right, is that's no fine. fuel. But even I, in levels I like really mostly just wanted to use them either You'll way. still see carriers drop off fuel pods. The AI still uses a hidden fuel mechanic for this level, but the player never has to. So that entire oh. mechanic has been lost. And you know what? Good. Fuck. Fuel. I like the idea of it. It could work great on larger maps, or with an overhaul like if a smaller ship gets too far away from support craft for too long. I'd like the extra depth that space supply lines could add, but how Homeworld 1 did it was mainly tedious. You still ah. have to build your smallest ships individually. Again, it wouldn't be until Homeworld 2 where you can make a squadron at once. Fuel could have worked better there, but it was already removed in that game. The consequence of this is some support ships aren't as useful anymore, but they're multi-role, so never gone completely. Docking mm, craft to them still heals good. them. An overhaul could work, but it was very flawed in the original. And at this rate, I know tedium. And fuel <laughs> tedium, I turned on Aurora this year. The second big change is a campaign oh, one. Boy. Dynamic difficulty scaling. Again, Dynamic. this is another Homeworld 2 thing. Basically, the size of your fleet and how rich you are determine how many enemies you fight in the next map. That's actually really good. It gives you a sizable challenge, so you can't just roll over the map. Which is kind of a problem in some RTSs where they let you keep your units. Because usually they always have yeah. you build a base at the start and, you know, get the point. It's a good way to try and keep things challenging, but a lot of people don't like it. When a mission ends, all you have, including your ships, carry over. It's a great example of how the story and gameplay are so intertwined in Homeworld. 
You're moving an entire civilization around. Every ship loss and resource counts. When a mission ends, you can mm. still linger around, collect resources, and build your fleet up. You nice. go when you choose to. And the remaster did import a great Homeworld 2 feature that auto-collects every resource on the map, so you don't have to do that manually. Still, players like to pull off maneuvers like hijacking a bunch of the enemy's ships so their fleet would be huge. You also get a lot mm -hmm. more visual variety, and your forces look even more ragtag. In this system, it means the battles will always be bigger. Honestly, I love a cool like ragtag group just put together. It's always fun to have. But funnily enough, I think this works better here than the second game, but it's still a fair point to make. Well, if you use the player patch, you can scale this back down or make the game even harder. If you don't want constant harsh battles, you can flip it off, and if you do, you can go nuts. With the way resource amounts and a few other things are updated, it's really the lack of options in the scaling that hurts the vanilla game. With the mod, there's nothing to worry about. If you never chips. played the 99 no, game, that's I'd nice. say don't worry that you're missing out on the original authentic experience or something like that. It still has a few annoying things missing here and there, but it is vastly, vastly better to actually play than the original. The best part is the collection still has that game in there. They're not trying to bury it away. Now I'm going to mm. get into what I like about the story, but not too much. As I said before, it's a pretty simple tale. Stealing a now, ship. when I said the story could be adapted to any setting, I didn't mean to imply that there's no lore. Homeworld has a lot of lore. The game came with a 115 page manual, which the remaster doesn't have, but you can find a PDF easily enough. Damn. You can read about the history of the Kushan and how the mothership was made, how all the technology works, the different cultures and clans on Carrick. It's a deep manual. Just being near it grants you a timeshare inside of a high school locker. <laughs> it's fun to know, but you don't need to know. Besides the tragedy, the start of the game opens a good mystery. Carrick was burned down by the Titan Empire because they violated a 4,000 year old treaty not to develop hyperspace technology. There's uh, an established galactic civilization and order to things, but you have no idea about any of it. So literally, you got that off of just chance. Yeah, damn, 115 pages. Yeah, that's a lot of lore. Apparently, Fallout also had a booklet for learning about a bit about the lore and how the game works overall. But obviously, I couldn't get that when I was playing Fallout 1, so... yeah... Your people have no choice but to go home, and this is causing huge repercussions. Where a lot of strategy games have you building an empire, here you're just a token on the board. Some mm. religions think the Kushan returning is a prophecy, or holy. Factions who don't like the Taidan are using the burning of Carrick to further their own agenda. This is interesting because they burn the, your home planet, so you have no choice but to go over to the other home planet. There's not really much choice. You can use them. You can, I've seen multi stream Huh. You feel like you're inside of a giant political game, but barely a player. I mean, what's an equivalent for this? Uh, okay, think about the isolated tribe on Sentinel Island. Okay. And then one day, the UN sees them playing around in a nearby territory, wearing power armor. Oh. Somehow, they're also experimenting with a nuclear weapon. The UN is flipping shit, and then someone nukes the island. But all the people and weapons they were afraid of weren't there and survived, and are now laying claim to a small part of Madagascar. Oh. Do you think that might shake up politics and cause a bunch of other situations to explode? Oh yeah, that definitely would. <laughs> but it's an interesting analogy that I use, which, yeah, to our scale that would make sense. Basically everyone's freaking out and trying to use, see if they can use this or stop them in some way. That's the story of Homeworld. There's a huge global shakeup going on, but you're only seeing it through a small, kind of mystical point of view. As the story goes on, the fleet grows, and you learn more. Your only message from the Taidan is right before you challenge them directly, and they're still a huge threat. It's a well-paced campaign, with satisfying reveals about the Kushan mm. and their Hagaran homeworld, and those who they encounter and even fight have some more dimensions to them. You know, except for the rocks. At its mm. core, it's a story about going home. You may have guessed they make it there. Okay. Because there wouldn't be a second- Oh my god. I'm pulling away from this because I- Stupid YouTube. Homeworld anyway. 2 has a different story approach. Okay. We start off with a bit of a retcon. Thousands of years ago, a progenitor hyperspace core was discovered, which oh, all space travel rock. is based on. Okay. Then, thousands of years later, the Kushan find the second core in the wreckage on their planet. So the mothership isn't just reverse-engineered, it's powered by an ancient, unfathomable technology. It does oh explain God. how the mothership is so absurdly powerful and how they managed to get home at all, but there's more to this. It's over a okay. hundred years later, and Karen is still alive and appears to be the same age. How? Homeworld Cataclysm took place between the games, but I believe it's been deemed to be non-canon. If you're directly connected to your ship like she was, you're called an Unbound, and for some reason live a very long time. I think how does that's that the explanation, but I'm not entirely sure. Anyways, this story's a little less Exodus and a little more Revelations. This uh. is the story of the end time. We know this because the third core has been found. What? Under the dark influence the ship of this is core, your life support? the Tardan ah. have risen under a new leader. A vaguer warrior lord 
named Makan. He calls himself the Sedrakar, the Chosen One. Okay. I don't know about this setting throwing the Chosen One out there. The intro heralds a big difference in the tone of these stories. In Homeworld 1, religious and mystic elements could definitely be felt, but they were also ambiguous. You could be a like human struggle or an act of destiny. It's a large unknown universe and anything is possible. Your progress is becoming known among the inner rim worlds and elsewhere. Many cultures have prophesized your return. It's possible, but fate is never proven. Now we have tangible ancient ones and prophecy, and it's central to the story. Oh no. I wonder how this will go. <sighs> what? The servant of your master? You seem to be a creature from hell. So oh. the mother was that gothic? I don't know much about gothic, but I think I think that was gothic. Ship is being commissioned, again commanded by Karen Sajet, and once again we're testing mm. it. Except the first was made for a journey into unknown space, and this one is being made during an active galactic war. The ship being near undefended is strange, and it's no wonder the Vagar show up to attack it. The mother oh. ship does escape and gets resupplied with the proper crew, but now the homeworld is under siege. Makan demands the second core, or else he'll destroy Hagara. The fleet must now travel through the galaxy to find an ancient relic that will stop the prophecy and end Makan's reign of terror. He simply can't okay. be the Sajuk car because that will mean the return of Sajuk. Oh? What does that mean? You'll have to find out. If the game sounds reliant mm -hmm. on the lore from the first Homeworld's manual, well, there are Older elements no of it hair. here, but huh. no, not really. The Homeworld 2 manual does have backstory, and it's a single page of it. This what? still gives more context to what's happening, but the whole prophecy thing is still kept vague. Compared to a journey, Homeworld 2 is more of a war story, one that's floating around an unknown doom prophecy at the center. There's more to unpack the here, but first I want to talk oh. about what's different. I'll start with the visuals again. I don't need to retread the technical graphics stuff because, yeah, the game looks good. They yeah. definitely had more to draw from directly with the sequel. It was a lot more graphically complex than its predecessor, so you have more to touch up. The new backgrounds are especially great. Okay. There can be deep shades of red and just harsher tones in general. Okay, so Even it if looks the writing doesn't nice. carry it, the game sure looks apocalyptic. The sheer size these battles get to, conveyed with cool. these backdrops, convey everything I need to know. Most of the ship designs have changed a lot too, as you would expect after a hundred years. The yeah. Garan ships are way less boxy and way more angular. These are more space planes and space boats than they were previously. A lot of the ships have large turrets ah. on them, even on something as relatively small Well, at least the art design is on point. I think this design works on larger ships like frigates and destroyers. There are some ships I love the look of, like the battlecruiser. But the turrets are more spaced out on those. The little ones can look like space tanks. The Higaran ships look more mm. sleek and dangerous now. Even a mine layer has a turret on it. Safe to cool. say the industrial look is now more space opera. It reminds me of the Dead Space 1 and 2 arguments. Some people enjoy the new looks, others think it was twisted too far. I think I'm in the same spot I was in that debate too. It likely wouldn't make sense for the ships to keep looking as Tonka truck as they were, but yeah. I definitely favor some of the first ships. Besides, the Vega and Tidan Remnant do carry on that spirit. On that argument, I love the designs of uh, Dead Space 2, and I feel like they fit just fine. Even though they were very clearly, uh, well, there's some influence of Iron Man in there, it definitely mm -hmm. works. The Vega are nomads, and their ships are extremely specialized even more so than the Kushans were. It's not like okay. the studio had forgotten the original design ideas, it's just a role reversal. My feelings haven't changed much here, I still love the look of the game. When it comes to audio, the fantastic new soundscape is here too. The biggest change is how more bombastic the music can be, and I'm completely here for it. Under fire, Ooh, order. nice. A very nice kind of desert theme to it. Yeah. Battle cruiser under attack. Group one, report squadron. Standing by. Pursuing targets. Strike group report possible contact. There's the same in three. Ah, okay. Strike group under enemy attack. Copy. Flak frigate complete. Taking damage. Group seven reporting. Standing by. This is still very good music, no matter what. Roger. Destination locked in. There's no adagio for strings moment, but they do use the music effectively for the cutscenes. Nothing I'll spoil here, though. When it comes to the gameplay, okay. the core hasn't changed. In the remaster's case, how you interact with and control the game is identical. However, with a new fleet composition comes a game that can feel very different. For better and worse, there's been some streamlining. As mentioned mm. before, Strikecraft are now built in a full squad, which does make sense. Yeah. The small fry were never ships you'd send in alone, so why bother building or maintaining individuals when they can just come out as a squad? 
If a squadron loses ships, you dock it back up and it replenishes. It's a welcome addition that I do think removed a lot of needless micromanagement. It's faster and simpler to build and control what you want in a fight. But yeah, more I than that, that got compressed in. Oh. Where Homeworld 1 had resource collectors, repair corvettes, and salvage corvettes, Homeworld 2 has the resource collector, which now fills out all those previous roles. Except oh. you can no longer whisk enemy ships away to the dungeon. There's now a dedicated marine oh. boarding frigate, which is much more vulnerable, and I really don't use it much outside of campaign. Yeah. You watch a bar fill, and the ship is yours, and... Man, I'm not a fan of it. It's not nearly as funny, or gremlin-like, <laughs> compared to physically seeing carrier privileges being revoked. <laughs> Literally having it grab the ships and pull it away. <laughs> I will admit, it is a bit funny, no matter what. Same kind of joy. The role combining goes across a few classes to reduce redundancy. Okay. Where the Kushan had five kinds of fighters, the Higarans only have three. They do try to make up for this. Where Homeworld's research was mainly about unlocking new ship types, Homeworld 2 has actual ship upgrades. They can get better stats or new abilities, but they don't go too in-depth. I mean, making them into a squad, well that stinks. To build or certain crafts, larger squad. ships like the mothership and carriers now have to build facilities for them. That means when you do make a carrier, you have to decide what its role will be and what it can build. You can upgrade other subsystems too, like better sensors. And best of all, the subsystems are now physically on the ships. These can be more vulnerable to different weapons, so capital fights are more tactical. Instead of spending a long time to completely break an enemy carrier, some bombers- I just realized the music in the background where it's from. It's from Metal Wolf Chaos. A game by, by uh, FromSoft. <laughs> It's about mm -hmm. the president of the United States using a mech to free America. Oh, wow. Yeah. This can swoop in and take out its ability to make new fighters. This adds a lot of options for good micromanagement. You still have the directional armor from before, but this adds a whole new layer to it. The story is not as engaging this time around, but the gameplay is. There's more mission variety and objectives Ooh. that feel different to play. They're nice. the kind of improvements that come after making something groundbreaking. They're not struggling as hard just trying to make the basic idea work anymore, they got that. Now it's how can we make things more interesting to play. They do pull this off for the most part, but now we have to go back to dynamic difficulty. Outside of taking some spaceship options away, this is my biggest gameplay issue. Well, actually, it's a few compounding things. See, before you chose when to leave a mission, and now, when the mission is done, so are you. Every oh. resource is auto-collected, and your fleet goes to the next mission as is. Here's how this gets yeah. messy. This is an act of war, so you can no longer pace it like it's the Oregon Trail. You still carry ships and tech over and everything else like before, but you no longer feel the impact, especially of their losses. Except in the worst of times. Each map has absurdly more resources. The fights are much larger, and the time to kill for smaller ships oh. is much quicker. You'll be building yeah. ships more than ever before, and they feel replaceable. As the fights get more massive, that you get closer stink. and closer to a danger tipping point. Enemy numbers might increase until you're fighting a death stack of battlecruisers. I already went over the scaling, but here's the difference. You can win a satisfying, hard-fought battle, but you can also win it the wrong way. The way oh, the next mission throws you into the lion's den, no. fairly a fleet team. Since you ju you can't, like, set up, you can't prepare for the next fight, so you get thrown in and you're just having to quickly scramble to get everything together. Yeah. yeah. That's the worst part oh, about God. an RTS, when the enemy has something full and you're just scrambling to defend main. yourself. Without the downtime, you can no longer strategize and build your yeah. fleet back up. You can be thrown into a new mission where you imminently need a bunch of ships that you no longer have. These missions could have multiple staged objectives, so you don't know it might automatically make you move forward. Unless you've already played the game or got screwed over and had to go back a bit. This can mean trying to set the map up to have a downtime period because the battles get so intense, instead of just actually having a downtime period. It might not sound like much, but once you've played it, not deciding when you can leave is a huge loss of control. I mean, that could be the point of it, but everything no longer gels together like it once did. In that light, I'm now going to briefly go over the story, and if you don't want spoilers, go to here. Okay, if it's a good game, I'll probably play it even with spoilers. I think I feel bad for anyone who skipped ahead and came back here. It's as stylish as ever, but playing it again now, man, this reminds me of the Rise of Skywalker in the worst way possible. Oh no, this is gonna be bad. Oh no. They mentioned the Rise of Skywalker. We are getting way too Stars War. Oh, to stop the prophecy, the Higarns will find War. a progenitor yeah. ship graveyard. Can they need to find Stars the wreck of a War. ship, which has a ship in the back of it, because the little ship can lead them to the Balcora Gate, which what? will then lead to Sajuk. It is a cool ship, and your longtime bros, the Bentuzi, helped you find it, alongside giving you the first hyperspace core, which they owned. You get to Halo, but okay. Makan is already there, and he has his own ancient dreadnought progenitor ship. These. What the hell? Hello. Oh, hi, Rain. Hello, Rain. Yeah, apparently he has his own gate that will help him get through there somehow. 
Dreadnoughts. Oh, uh, that would be more. That would be rain over here. The gatekeepers of Sajuk, and I guess it doesn't matter how Makan got one. Anyhow, on the other side of the gate is a huge warship. This okay. is Sajuk, another big ship. You defeat Makan, you loot his pants and his hyperspace core, and all three cores have slots instead of Sajuk that they you go into. The entire mothership okay. crew transfers over, and the whole ship jumps back to Hagara. The battle there has remained intense, but the Vega have brought their Man of Steel atmosphere killers. These launch missiles that will kill the entire population, and the missile launchers are immune to every weapon ever conceived, except for the Jesus ship. That's stupid! Why? How would that work? I don't understand that. Also, Rain... No, not either. Uh, Fable is sick, so he's not going to be here. So the big payoff is scattering your fleet around to shoot down missiles before they kill the entire Fable population. Is sick. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. yes, he is. Uh, yeah. While the primordial enterprise slow boats to each launcher to take it down. This scenario really doesn't let you feel the true power of Sajuk. And getting here was a string of we have to find a thing to find a thing to find a thing. With final victory comes a final reveal. Sajuk opens a new galactic network of hyperspace gates. This will significantly okay. reduce galactic commute times and increase trade and prosperity. Thus ushers in the Age of Sajet. It wasn't Makan, but her who was the chosen one, the Sajuk car. The galaxy has uh, changed forever, and I feel nothing. It's not wonderful. horrible, and the nature of the first <laughs> game's story nothing. does make it hard to follow up on since there is a kind of finality to it. This could yeah. have just been a political war story, or if they were going to go full mysticism, at least explore the elements more. Instead, yeah. we get a messy blend of things. It's never really stuck with me. Strike I'm not Third impact there. confirmed. Homeworld 2 genuinely has some great features and ideas, but with how some things were cut down and how the campaign was written, it's no surprise it doesn't resonate like the original. Luckily, the game's skirmish mode lets you play in any faction from across both games. There are plenty of hours to be spent here, and the player's patch well, adds even more nice. options, like letting you control two fleets. This game is very cool. worth picking up, and especially now. After talking with GOG, I have an affiliate deal unlike any I've had before. Using the pinned link, you can pick up the entire remastered collection for 95% off. I was going to say it's well worth oh, the 30 wow. bucks. This is less than two. Wow, that's actually real nice. Damn. I don't know if it's still on that, but goddamn. It's a fantastic strategy series and a visually faithful remaster. I desperately wish Cataclysm got the same treatment, but as of the time of this video, the source code is still missing for that one. There is Homeworld 3 to keep an eye on, and next year I want to talk about how this series mm. handled ground combat. So I've got that to keep me going. Have a wonderful Christmas, or any other holidays you'll be celebrating. I'll see you next time. See ya. I think this music is from Deadly Premonition. I'm not sure. Best Christmas present given or received. Well, when I was a kid, I got this badly wrapped, like, box. It was like a shoe box and dented it and, like, kind of wet. It looked awful. But he was pranking me and a brand new copy of Tiberian Sun was inside. Aww. I got maybe a game or two a year back then, so I wasn't expecting that at all. No matter what I've gotten since, I always look back on that. that what is my sweet. least favorite Pokemon? The only mainline game I owned and played was Pokemon Gold. I hated Zubats, and later I would discover Cliff Racers. Am hmm. I technically a VTuber? I hope not. <laughs> Could a 40k Total War be- Well, you hope not. I don't think he's technically a VTuber. He doesn't have a PNG at the very least, so he's not really. I don't know how he would be a VTuber, but yeah. We'll do Home World 3 later. Should it? I don't know if it should, but give it a few years. It's inevitable. Did it's I probably have a gonna teacher happen. I could never get along with. I did, and it was in first grade. As a kid, I was left-handed, but she would take points off my paper and other coercion methods if she saw me using my left hand instead of my right. Wow! Right what the hell? Anything. So now I'm right-handed, and my handwriting Wait, is still horrible. I found out. Uh, basically, he was left-handed, and this lady uh, basically forced him to write with his right hand, which uh, made his work look awful. Yeah. So she would take points off if he wrote with his left hand, which is stupid. That's, yeah, that's stupid. I'm a lefty. ...that I happened to look like how her son did at the same age, and they had had, like, a huge falling out or something, and they hated each other. So she got her revenge on a left-handed six-year-old. It sucked oh, back then, but it's funny damn. to look back on. So she only hated him because she he looked like her son. Wow. That's... That's well, petty. That, that's that's incredibly petty. Very All right, petty. Stay safe out there. Oh, but, right. Don't forget to play the Tyrannic Raiders bonus mission. This being missing was a big deal. We desperately need more games like this. He's not wrong. We need more games like this. That's why I'm looking at uh, indie yeah. RTSs and see if I can find any. 
right now they're all in product all the ones that I've seen are only in production but if you guys find any please tell me down in the comics please I would love to hear about some so yeah if you like our stuff subscribe and uh, I'll see you guys later you say who forced me to do the same thing that's insane thank you all so much I'll see you guys later